So where did it all begin, this birth of radio broadcasting? Well, it owes its origins to the First World War, the Great War, the war to end all wars. That tragic conflict that had destroyed nations and had destroyed the lives of some 20 million people had also done one other thing. It had driven technology ahead. It had driven the concepts of radio engineering and the science of the thermionic valve such that by 1919, a whole new science had been born. And it was in Chelmsford at the Marconi New Street Works that two engineers, H.J. Round and Bill Ditcham, put together a series of trials actually in the Ballad Bunyan station in Ireland. And by accident, uh, Bill Ditcham's voice became the first human voice to cross the Atlantic Ocean from east to west. But their experiments were going to do much more. They were going to change the world. In January 1920, they started a series of experiments. These were private Marconi company only tests. They sent telegrams out to all the Marconi stations around the world saying, please listen between 7 and 7.30 in the morning and 7 and 7.30 in the evening. And they were just going to transmit speech. In the parlance of the day, it was called telephony. Because up to that time, all communications, be it the Marconi radio operators on board the Titanic calling CQD or SOS was all in Morse code. But this was the first time that they were going to transmit speech. They had no idea what it was going to happen. And they built a 6,000 watt transmitter and they suspended an aerial between two huge 450 feet high masts that towered over the Marconi New Street Works in Chelmsford and of course over the city. And they decided that they would just transmit words talk into the microphone and see what happened. Initially, they just read from Bradshaw's train timetable. Uh, I like to think of it as the first work of fiction on British radio. Um, but let's face it, that was very boring. And after three or four days, Bill Ditcham did something else. And what he did was going to change the world. He bought a newspaper and he sat down at seven o'clock in the evening and he just started reading from the first page. Hello CQ. This is station MZX calling from Chelmsford, and here is the news. One of the items that Bill Ditcham could have read from the Essex Chronicle appeared in an edition for Friday, January 16th, 1920, although it appears to have been written in a style of some years previous. The item is headed, New Wireless Call for Distress at Sea, Mr Marconi's Wonderful Invention. When disaster overtook the Titanic, Mr Marconi of wireless fame foreshadowed a device for assisting to save life at sea. He was developing this when war broke out and then all the energies of the staff and employees of the company's works at Chelmsford and Marconi House in London were devoted to winning the war. Since the signing of the armistice, the device has been improved upon with the result that an automatic apparatus is now ready for all classes of shipping and this undoubtedly would do much to reduce the death toll amongst those crossing the seas. The device is simple from a scientific point of view and is believed to be infallible. It then goes on to say that yesterday a series of interesting demonstrations with the system were carried out at the Hall Street Works, Chelmsford, in the presence of newspaper and shipping representatives. Well, Ditcham and Round's experiments in January and February of 1920 were amazingly successful. In fact, 50, 60 people used to gather outside of the Marconi work saying, we love your newscast, please do it again. Because all the radio amateurs, the radio hams, many of them ex-servicemen had come back from the trenches, either been trained in the use of radio or had seen radio being used, had built their own sets but all they could hear was the clatter of Morse code. Now they heard a man speaking and reading the news. Arthur Burroughs, the head of publicity, was a journalist and he was already convinced that the future lay in a British broadcasting system where everybody, uh, rich and poor, from the four corners of the nation could listen to radio coming into their front rooms. This is March 1920, nothing like it had been thought of before. And yet they decided to set a second series of experiments and they, for the first time, they said, well, can we broadcast music, maybe even a singer? So in March 1920, Ditchman Round had seen a group performing in Chelmsford at a local pub. They were called Freddie and the Funyuns. Freddie Munyon ran it and their lady singer was a lovely lady called... 
come to that, to that, that last section again. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, I've been writing about her afternoon. I'll just try that again. Okay. <coughs> Two, three. So Ditcham and Brown decided they would try a second phase of experiments. They would try and broadcast music. Now, they could play gramophone records, and they tried that, but then they thought, what about live music, yeah, even live instruments? They'd seen a band performing in a local pub called Freddie and the Funyuns, run by Freddie Munyon, a, a well-known businessman and character from the town. His lead singer was Miss Winifred Sayer, a lovely lady who actually worked for Hoffman's, the ball bearing company. She was invited along, and for three nights in March 1920, she became the first lady ever to sing on British radio. It was actually an accident because they suddenly found the microphones couldn't cope with the sound of violins or pianos. So dear Winifred Say had to sing unaccompanied just with the opening sound of a tuning fork. And the first song she sang was an Edwardian ballad called Absent. And in doing so, she made history. And sometimes in the twilight gloom apart The tall trees whisper, whisper heart to heart Oh, my far lips the eager answers fall Thinking I hear thee, thinking I hear These concerts proved to be very successful. It was amazing how good the signal was all across Europe. Signal reports flooded in, and in fact, Winifred Sayer was invited into the Marconi works and shown signal reports from the east coast of America. She was shown reports from Iran. An RAF a squadron leader actually listened in 2,600 miles away to her singing. She was amazed, and, and her father, who was not did not believe that radio had any future, was also suddenly surprised that this was a future. One other person was interested, that was Lord Northcliffe. He was the extremely wealthy proprietor of the Daily Mail and the Times newspaper in London, and he had a soft spot for new technology. So Northcliffe looked around. He wanted the biggest and the best, and who did he find? Who did he find was in town? Well, it was Dame Millie Melba the superstar Australian soprano. She was in London doing a concert at the Royal Albert Hall. He had to pay her a thousand pounds to come to this deserted works one summer evening in June 1920. Today that's an immense amount of money, somewhere around 300,000 pounds for one 20 minute concert. But after some initial concern, my voice is not the subject for experimentation by young wireless wizards and their magic play boxes. Melba came, 15th of June, 1920. She was picked up from Chelmsford Station in a white Rolls Royce. She was driven around town. The Daily Mail organised crowds to greet and welcome her. She arrived in the Marconi New Street Works and Arthur Burroughs looked up and showed her the enormous mass. He said, Madam Melba, from the top of those masts, your voice will be heard across the world. Her reply is now radio folklore. Young man, it's all very impressive, but if you think I'm going to climb up there, you're sadly mistaken. Okay. Or shall I leave now? They convinced her to stay. They gave her a special dinner, which was partly cooked chicken, unleavened white bread and pink champagne and she stepped to the microphone. She was used to the grandest concert halls in Europe. Now she was in a deserted packing shed next to the main high broadcast transmitter hall. She had no real idea what was going to happen. She looked at the microphone, which was actually a telephone handset with a cigar box cone broken and joined to it. Arthur Burroughs stepped to the microphone and said, hello CQ, this is station MZX calling from Chelmsford, and Madame Melba will now sing. And at that precise moment, the whole world changed. The concert was a great success, and further concerts soon followed. These were all instigated by the Daily Mail. The Marconi Company was already getting very concerned about the amount of time and effort they were putting into this strange new science. 
Dame Clara Butt came, Lawrence Melchior came, and they sang their heart out. This enormous signal by now 15,000 watts smashed across the world. But it was also doing one other thing. When Chelms was on air with their musical soirees, no other radio station in Europe could actually function. They simply drowned everything out. It was not the best of starts because already the embryonic air traffic control system was started. People were getting on civilian airliners and flying across Europe. It wasn't great if when they needed urgent air traffic information, all they could hear was chumps of performing. By November 1920, it was clear the end had come and that something had to give. And the Postmaster General, the Right Honourable F.G. Kellaway, MP, announced that Chelmsford concerts would stop forthwith. They were purely experimental. They were only operating on a day-by-day -day basis with an experimental licence by the post officer's grace, and there were to be no more licences. Actually, the Marconi Company weren't that concerned. This was already a huge drain. They simply packed the equipment and sent it all back to Ballybunny in Ireland. And so, the centenary of British radio broadcasting today in 2020 is here. It's a hundred years since Winifred Sayer stepped to the microphone. It's a hundred years since Dame Lily Melba came and graced the boards of that deserted packing shed in Chelmsford. It's a hundred years since our modern wireless age began. And today, wireless is a strange word. People think of it more as internet and wireless lands, because today we call it radio. And this is the time when the world changes. This is when radio broadcasting begins. It couldn't begin in 1920, because the time was not quite right. It needed one other part of the story, and that would actually hand over to the radio amateurs. The radio hams, who had kept faith with Chelmsford and Marconi for the past year, year and a half, they were determined that radio broadcasting would come back. In America, it had exploded. Thousands of stations had jammed the airwaves. And the British government and the post office were convinced that was not going to happen in Britain. But what to do? Through 1921, huge petitions and lobbies were taken out. And eventually, by the end of 1921, the post office relented and said, the Marconi Company could do another broadcast station but only with 400 watts, not 15,000. But there was a problem. All the Marconi high powers equipment had been removed and there was nobody to do it. And there are moments in time when history changes and the cosmic clock ticks on. This is one such moment because Arthur Burroughs looked round and he looked around for the best people to do speech or telephony broadcasting. And he looked towards Riddle. A team called the Airborne Wireless Research Development Group run by Captain Eckersley. Eckersley was an amazing person, uh, World War I pioneer of radio. He'd actually developed the first speech broadcast equipment that the RFC used over the battlefield of Passchendaele. He'd also developed all the equipment for Croydon and the air traffic control systems that had been blotted out by Chelmsford on air. In January 1922, he was told that he was going to do broadcasting, this thing called broadcasting. He had no idea what it was, but he thought, this could be fun. Hello, CQ. Hello, CQ. This is 2 Emma Talk, Riddle testing. This is 2 Emma Talk, Riddle testing. Hello, CQ. Hello. Hello, Ash. Hello, Ash. Ash, hello. Are the signals OK? No, they're not. Wave your hand if it's all OK. No waves? No waves at all. Curse. Kirk, is that all right in there? Kirk! No, not, sorry, sorry, well, sorry. And so the torch passed. Peter Eckersley and his small band of desperado engineers in this small hut in Rittle, on a Tuesday evening at 7.30, set about doing this thing called broadcasting. There were no rules or no regulations. Nobody knew what it was. But with Peter Eckersley at the microphone, the world would change. This is 2 Emma Talk, Rittle testing. Hello, CQ, hello, CQ. This is 2 Emma Talk, Rittle testing. Uh, calling to you now, calling, not testing. He was a natural raconteur, humorous DJ, comedian. And what they did during the summer of 1922 was to change the world forever. Basically, in the space of four or five short months, he defined the art and science of radio broadcasting as we know it today. The first radio play, the first quiz, the first children's programmes, the first competitions, the first Lonely Hearts Club, the first comedy, the first humour, the first opera, the first 
sound effects studio, all created in this first small hut in Rittle. And he was amazingly successful. By the end of the summer of 1922, estimates of the number of listening, listeners go from 50,000 to a quarter of a million. Newspapers carried and hung on his every word. He calls political and diplomatic incidences. He had no rules because Eckersley was an inveterate pricker of balloons. He just loved talking to his audience, and he did. For the first time, he addressed the microphone as if it was a friend. Hello, CQ. Hello, CQ. This is two Emma talk riddle testing. This is two Emma talk riddle testing. Tonight, we have a most marvelous thing that's going to happen. We are going to receive Rome, that famous Italian tenor, that famous Italian tenor, what's his name? Gridlico is going to sing non puto pirore pantissimo, which being translated means um, it's very difficult. CQ, the concert's ended, sad wails the heterodyne. You must soon switch off your valves, I must soon switch off mine. Now we're going to receive it. There may be some atmospherics, there may be some, there may be some jamming, pa, 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 pa. there may be some oscillation. Whew, but hang on, CQ. And he spoke to these tens of thousands of people as if he was their best friend and he was in their front room with them. It didn't matter what Captain Eckersley said, they just knew he said it well. By September 1922, 50 companies wanted to join the party. You're now standing in the uh, hut from which the original broadcasts for regular broadcasts were made. Um, in fact, the start of the BBC really here. Uh, and this is the transmitter. It's a copy of the transmitter which uh, was used for those early broadcasts. This is called the uh, 2MT transmitter. The British government knew that really they had to bring it under control. They got together the seven great companies who dominated radio and radio engineering and after some considerable debate they decided a new company, a single company was needed to actually run broadcasting in Britain and with great solemnity they announced this company would be called the British Broadcasting Company. It started in November 1922 its first announcer was Arthur Burroughs who transferred to the fledging new company and his call sign was 2LO, 2 London. Actually, was originally a Marconi station that they transferred to the BBC. And really, this is where that cosmic clock and history goes one stage further. For the first few months, Rittle, 2MT, and 2LO shared the same airways. In fact, 2MT at Rittle, this maverick band of engineers, became the only radio station to legally share the airwaves with the BBC for probably the next 50 or 60 years to the advent of commercial radio in the late 1960s. But really, the BBC was the future. With its new Director General, Managing Director John Rees, starting on the 1st of January 1923, it was clear that the pioneers at Rittle had run their course. On the 17th of January 1923, the Rittle station shut down. Eckersley toasted his listeners with the pop of a champagne bottle, which was actually ginger beer, but such was the magic of radio. And he said goodbye. For him, it wasn't the end of the story, because the new BBC needed a new chief engineer, and it was Peter Eckersley who joined to become the first chief engineer. He knew he was the chief engineer because he was, in fact, the only engineer. When he left, seven years later, over 650 engineers had joined him, including the majority of the Rittle team, with Reith at the helm and Eckersley driving engineering, the BBC just grew from strength to strength. It was incredible. Within two years, they had 10 major cities covered by powerful transmitters. A further 10 came online with 10 relay stations by the end of 1925. 
he instigated a relay and regional system whereby Britain could hear now two channels with the advent of the long wave 5SX Daventry and the shortwave system, suddenly Europe was now listening to the omnipresent BBC. It was a very different world to Riddle. There was no humour, there was no jokes, there was no comedy, but the BBC was the next step in the birth of British broadcasting. I think it's a little humbling to think that all that started just a few years earlier in a small packing shed in the Marconi New Street Works in Chelmsford when Arthur Burroughs stepped the microphone and said, hello CQ, this is Station MZX calling, and Madame Melba is about to sing. 